Hello everybody, it's Gavin Lawrence with American Players Theatre. Welcome to this episode of In the Wake of Our Shadow, Black Voices. Diane McIntyre is an award-winning choreographer who creates works for concert dance, theater, film, and opera. She views the dancer as a musical instrument merging with sound, language, and visuals to generate vibrant narrative. She received a 2020 United States Artists Fellowship, the 2019 Dance USA Honor Award, a 2016 Doris Duke Artist Award, and the 2007 Guggenheim Fellowship. Sounds in Motion, her original Harlem-based dance music company and subsequent ensembles have toured internationally and appeared in major U.S. venues such as the Joyce Theater, the Kennedy Center, New York Live Arts, Walker Arts Center, Jacob's Pillow, and countless others over her almost 50-year career. I could go on and on and on here but I want to make sure we have time <laughs> to actually speak with Diane and have this conversation with this amazing artist, this amazing choreographer. So I'm just going to read a few more things and then we'll bring Diane on. Uh, some of the people with whom she has uh, collaborated in uh, music, theater, and film are people such as Olu Dara, Hannibal Lokumbe, Cecil Taylor, Butch Morris, Amina Claudine Myers, Don Pullen, Max Roach, Lester Bowie, Sharon Freeman, Marion McClinton, Regina Taylor, Jonathan Demi, Douglas Turner Ward, Bartlett Sher, August Wilson, Oyamo, Intasaki Shange, Avery Brooks, Rita Dove, Geraldine Fitzgerald, Joe Sargent, Glenda Dickerson, Woody King Jr., Irene Lewis, uh, Scott, and Rick Kahn. Whew. So it is an absolute pleasure and honor to welcome Diane McIntyre, the one and only Diane <laughs> McIntyre, to this episode of In the Wake of Our Shadow Black Voices. Hey, Diane. Hi, Gavin. <laughs> great to it's, see you. It's mm -hmm. great, great to see you. So you are currently back home in Cleveland. Yes, in my hometown of in Cleveland, hometown, Ohio. Which yes. is where you were born, where you grew up, where you, where dance first became a part of your life? Yes. You want me to tell you something about that? I'd love for you to tell me how <laughs> either dance came to you or you came to it or you all found each other. Okay. So in Cleveland, uh, they say that I always danced. My parents said I always danced. I danced around the house. They had the radio on a lot and whatever music I heard on the radio, then I would move like that music, okay? Mm -hmm. And then my father had a friend named Elaine Gibbs. Her name's Redmond now, Elaine Gibbs, Miss Gibbs. And she was starting a dance school in her basement, which was not far from where we lived. So my mother said, Elaine, take her, take her. She's just moving all the time. She just got to dance. So I went to Elaine Gibbs and I was one of her first, maybe her first student in her basement. I think I was four, I think I was four years old. And I didn't know actually until I returned to Cleveland, maybe when I was talking to her in 2004 or five, where she got her background. That was a, that's a whole nother story. Okay. <laughs> Ohio Dance, which is a wonderful organization here in Ohio. They had, they did a whole interview with her about her history and how she learned to dance. So she gave us the ballet, some tap, very, Elaine is a very elegant woman we continue our journey together <laughs> because I guess she must have been only 18 or 19 when she started teaching me. Wow. 
then uh, then then she opened at then we actually went to Corey school Corey Corey is a major um, church black church here in Cleveland and historical church uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and other luminaries have spoken there and we had our classes in the gym which was in the basement and I must have been six I must have been five or six because uh, Elaine who was my dance teacher she told me that come coming to visit our class one day was the ballerina Janet Collins mm -hmm. she was a major pioneer in our dance world and also with her that day was Paul Robeson wow they were both visiting Cleveland so this was, uh, of course, I knew nothing about this. <laughs> the thing is that what Elaine said, that as she watched all the children, Janet Collins pointed to me and said, you have a dancer there. They were touring an, a production of Aida. Okay. And Janet Collins was the premier dancer in that work she was a ballerina and i will never forget we're sitting way way up in the balcony and she did a dance on a balcony <laughs> in the set the set was in a balcony she did all these pure wets pure wets just the, like oh my goodness and she was a brown woman mm. i said I want to do that. Wow. I want to be that. Okay, the place where I grew up in Cleveland, my parents lived in, first we lived in the, what was more um, pre, a predominantly black neighborhood, the Glenville neighborhood. Very, okay, we don't want to go into all kinds of detailed history. But in those days, yes, all of us of all different economic backgrounds, professional, working class, all of that, we all lived together. Not only did we all live, I meant we didn't live in the same house. We all lived in the same neighborhood. And we went, all of us went to the businesses of black people. Mm the doctor, the pharmacist, the grocery store, the everybody. It's just, it, it, that's just how it was. It wasn't, and we were born into that. When, when, when I got older, not too much older, but when we had a TV, then, you know, we saw white people on television. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, I, I guess we went to the store yeah we, we went to we went to stores we we did see white people wow. i remember one time i was we went to the drive-in movie and the drive-in movie used to have a um playground in the front and i was up there swinging or on i was very athletic too i was swinging or climbing on the monkey bars or something like that and this little boy came by little boy he was white and he said are you a little colored girl? I said, yes. He said, oh. I don't, there's certain things just stick in your mind. Yeah. So my sister and I, sometimes we try to analyze what that was. He, he it was something like, it was very, he, he was very open. He had never seen a person of my color before especially not on TV, you know, not even on TV or in a movie. Sure. So something in his family history made it so that I was okay. And that yeah. he had a, a, a gift in actually meeting a little colored girl. Hmm. So that was very sweet. Then we moved to a neighborhood called Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant, when we first moved here, in 1953, we were the first 
black family on the block. And it's a long block. Even though my father had grown up around the corner, the neighborhood stayed as it had with only one or two black families in each block. When we moved here, 1953, so our school was what you would call integrated, black and white children. Maybe it was more predominantly white at that time. So we had after school arts and I joined the dance a club, of course. I don't think it was called, a, maybe it was a club. And it took place at the library, the local library, which is at the end of our street. There we had modern dance classes. With Elaine Gibbs, I studied ballet. This was modern dance, which later when I came to New York or years later, I found out that it was very unusual for a child to be able to take modern dance classes. In the 50s, 60s, modern dance was taught mostly just in the universities. So we had, my teacher was named Virginia Dryansky, Miss Dryansky. She was a fabulous dancer, oh my goodness. She was a fabulous dancer with a long black ponytail. Even though our school was integrated, for some reason, our dance group was predominantly, predominantly black. And even though Virginia Dryansky was white, Virginia danced with the Caramu dancers. She was maybe, maybe was the only white dancer or only one of a couple of white dancers. So Caramu is the oldest historically producing black theater in the United States, founded in 1915. Mm -hmm. so, so Virginia had been dancing the spiritual. She was in a black culture, a black culture center. So the dances and the choreography that she shared with us came from her experience, which was that. And at the same time, she gave us very strong dance technique. When I was seven years old, I had my first production and um, I gathered a number of people. I think it was a dance drama because it may have had, it may have had dialogue. <laughs> so you were producing at seven. Right? Yeah, at seven. Wow. yeah. And at seven, I had put the whole thing together and a good friend of mine, um, Judy Fox, her sister, was a, who was about 12, she was a lot older than us. She was a good pianist. So I hired, I mean, <laughs> I, I, we didn't have any money. So I had a uh, Judy sister was the pianist. Of course we had to have, I guess I started out with live music. So yeah, I had my first production and I, I realized my mother or my grandfather, they made little tickets and people were actually coming. <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So that was that was the genesis. That was the beginning of you as as this producer, choreographer, person creating your own work at That's seven. That's right. That's right. Seven. Yeah. Can, can can we jump forward a little bit to? Yeah, sorry, I was getting. No, it. no, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Can we jump forward to to when you started doing that professionally? When you when you moved to New York and decided to uh to start your own dance company, yes. Sounds in Motion. Okay. So when, when I was in college at the Ohio State University, we had a lot of guest artists. And two of our guest artists were uh, uh, Judith Dunn and Bill Dixon. She had formerly been with the Cunningham Company, that's Merce Cunningham Company. And he was a musician called in the avant-garde or new music world. They collaborated and they taught us work and they taught us their ideas of improvisation and all this. I was totally um, enamored of that type of work and I liked their dance and music connection. So when I moved to New York in 1970, I took dance classes all around town and I also sought out music that was like the music style that Bill Dixon played. So I went to hear a lot of music around town. I went to the lofts, I went to the clubs, I went to concerts. 
And then I connected with a group called the Master Brotherhood. This group was rehearsing in a daycare center in Brooklyn. And they, one of the, um, they were all male. One of them was, worked at the daycare center and they allowed him to have his group there in the evening to rehearse. So there were about six guys in the uh, group. So I, I asked them, was it okay to come and listen to them rehearse? They said, oh, sure. So then one day I asked if I could uh, go over into a corner and move to their music. They're like, yeah, whatever you like to do. <laughs> so over time, I went to all of their rehearsals. I don't know if they, they don't call them rehearsals, <laughs> they call their practice. I went, went every week, maybe once or twice a week, and I would go into a corner and try to make myself move the way their instruments sounded. So I was moving in a way, even though I have very fine training in the uh, contemporary or what you call modern dance field, I had some of the finest teachers in the university and in New York City. Nobody had moved like the way that music sounded. And my body was moving ways that were, I'm like, whoa, this is different. Whoa. Then finally, I asked them if I could move in front of their, in front of their music. Hmm. There was a little platform, a little stage there. So I did. So I was moving and in a way was part of the band. Eventually, I did my very first concert, which was in, um, March of, of 1972, almost 50 years from the date of this interview that we're doing. Hmm. And in that uh, concert, I invited some of those musicians to be in the concert with me. So Louise Roberts, the director, she helped me with my auditions for the dancers. And I said, nobody even knows me. Why will they come? She, why will they come? <laughs> to the audition, she said, they'll come because they're hungry to dance. Mm. And she was right. So then somebody said, wow, that was, and we did the, the piece at, a, at, we did our concert at a place called the Cubiculo. It was on 51st, I believe. And it was a loft space, mostly for theater. So after that, the people said, wow, that was a dynamic concert. And we also, which I forgot to say, is that we, we incorporated improvisational elements in the work with the musicians. The, I never advertised that. I never put it even in a program mm. that there are improvisational elements here. Mm. Because I felt in the, even though in the so-called jazz world, the people are applauded, highly applauded, for the improvisational skills. In the dance world, even today, if the people are improvising, there is not looked upon as favorably. The uh -huh. skill to improvise in dance is not as much applauded in the, in the dance world as it is in the music. So I never said it. So it sounds in motion, you continued this practice of, I mean, the title, the name Sounds in Motion clearly grew out of yeah. your experience with those musicians. Yeah, Can dance, you talk is, dance is music moving. Hmm. That's that's was my, because the musicians also were educating me in more kind of Eastern philosophy. Yes. In different books and all that they would have me read. Not, not that they had me read, but we just in conversations. Uh, uh, they were a lot of, they were and are a lot of my educators, the right. musicians, so-called jazz musicians. I say so-called because they don't all, you know, every one of them doesn't necessarily lose, use that. But yes, and in one of those books, the Sufi message, the person who wrote it said, dance is music moving. Hmm. It was called hmm. the Sufi message of music. And there was a section there about dance. I'm like, yes, that's what I believe. <laughs> dance is music moving. It's one. The dance and music yeah. are one. 
Yes, that's. And then, yeah, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, then somebody, after we did that first concert, they said, whoa. Now, this was after my first concert. Somebody said, whoa, you should start a company because you could get money in order to keep doing what you want to do. Mm. I said, really? They said, yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, I will do that. So I went through the um, process of establishing a 501c3, which in those days was very simple. Mm. I, I hear comparatively, now it's pretty difficult. And then we became a company and I called it Sounds in Motion. And Sounds in Motion was the name of that first concert, but it wasn't the name of the company yet. I see. So, and we kept on just kept on you kept going on. you <laughs> kept going you kept going yeah and boy did you keep going the amount yeah. of the amount of work that you all created and shared with the world it, i i wish people in the world of the arts theater and and not just dance but theater because you are a theater artist <laughs> also i just wish more people knew about what you all have done you know and it's, it's unfortunate that not more people do, which is why I'm really happy <laughs> that you are here sharing this yeah. story. Can you talk a little bit about those early productions that you all did as Sounds in Motion? I think one of your early ones was uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God. That Well, that wasn't all that early. It wasn't. Anyway, <laughs> that was in the 80s. That was oh, in the I see. 80s. But in the early days, yes, we did works we did we did two we did work some that had the african american experience yes. like uh very obviously and we're a whole company of black individuals and expressing that through the dance and through the music some of that expression was actually more narrative mm -hmm. and some of it was more in the connection of the dance music poetry and it exploded out over the stage and that explosion of it coming out over the stage is what touched people hmm. or they're like wow wow look at these brown people doing this even though there are a lot of brown people in the audience too look at these brown people doing this yes so tomorrow i'm gonna go and finish that painting i was doing hmm. or i am going and really look for that job or I am going to put my child in, take some music class. Something, it just like would inspire people and they're like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that history. So we had that and sometimes it was pure music dance. So then it came along that somewhere in the 1980s, one of the people, Woody King Jr., um, one of our major theater producers in New York City, who has celebrated 50, more than 50 years as a theater producer. One day he said, Diane, you know, sometimes when people, he wasn't talking specifically about me, sometimes when people come to um, see modern dance, the people kind of lost, or they're like, okay, what are they doing? <laughs> okay, it tickled me. Okay, <laughs> he said that. He said, I felt that if you did a piece, he wasn't critiquing me, he just in general. He said, I feel if you did something that was had the title of a novel that's known to people, then people would be drawn to it. He said, now you don't even have to do the piece literally. You don't even have to do the novel literally. He said, just have the title. Mm. That'll get the people there. He said, you could do an abstract version. I said, okay. I said, my favorite novel is Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. He said, okay, do that. So that's what I did. And another comment that was always in my head, my father would say, oh, your dance world you're in, in the modern dance. We didn't use the word contemporary. He said, it's wonderful. He said, but you all are always dancing on a bare stage. I said, Right, Daddy. Okay. So anyway, so I was determined in their eyes were watching God, we were going to have a set. We were going to have a set and we're going to have props and we're going to. So something happened where I just started at the beginning and then ended up actually literally choreographing the whole book. 
Of course you did. <laughs> and this had no words. There were no, oh, Oludara, one of my primary collaborators, uh, was the one of the composers. And the other composer was Butch Morris. The uh, Olu, I wanted him to bring that country, down home, blues feeling to the music with the band. And Butch, I wanted him to bring intrigue music, like in a movie. Mm -hmm. So the two of them came together and did that with the same band. And it worked out very well. Wow. Zora so one, Neale. No, go ahead. Yeah, Zora Neale Hurston. One time there was a drummer working with me, um, Steve Solder, way back in the 70s, early 70s. And he wasn't part of the Master Brotherhood, though. And he said, Diane, you remind me of Zora Neale Hurston. I'm like, who is that? He said, you're just like her because you like research. Hmm. And the research comes into your art. He said, so you should know her. So after that, I started following her. I mean, reading her wor her words in her novels. And there was no, uh, her language. Oh, my yeah. goodness. It's Just interesting. It's, it's interesting that that their eyes were watching God was your favorite novel because, you know, she wrote in our vernacular or in the vernacular yes. of the people from where she yes. came, right? And as you know, there was a time when, to certain um, ears, that was not considered appropriate in terms of black art. You know, there were there were those artists who felt that we should sound like the status quo or, or the mainstream. But yeah. she and and August Wilson also said that our grammar is our vernacular, mm. that the grammar that is ours is yeah. just as powerful, beautiful, poetic, poetic. relative yeah. and valid as any others. And it's interesting because one of the things that we are looking at here at, at American Players, which is traditionally has been known as a classical theater, is what does that term mean? Classical, mm -hmm. what, what is classical writing? What is classical dance? What is classical art? Like who decides what makes something classical? And so much of our history or during our history, we have looked at that term through like a Western lens. Yes. And I just find it really beautiful because I feel from the work of yours that I've experienced is that you have your own vernacular and it is deeply steeped in our vernacular. In, yes. in, in the vernacular of our people in a way that uh, is absolutely beautiful and should be considered classic and classical because oh, it speaks you. to our individual in experience as a people, but it also speaks to the human experience. It, you know, yeah. and that isn't that what great art does? Isn't that what should create something uh, to become a classic? Is it something that speaks to all people and I think will survive time? Yes. So I just find it amazing that that was, that was what inspired you, that Zora Neale, because she's one of my heroes, as as August Wilson is one of my heroes. <laughs> yes, yeah. the two of them, <laughs> they write in the vernacular, and they are very, they are geniuses hmm. in the way that they can uh, put the the words together in a way that's so uniquely their own. Hmm. Well, when you mentioned about classical, mm. I made a few notes about what I think. God okay. Do. You want to hear? I absolutely do. Okay, I have to read it. Okay. A classic. Mm. I'm I'm talking about classic in the arts. Yes. In dance. Uh, mostly, I thought about dance, literature, and theater. Yes. That in any era, the work is something people can recognize in themselves. They can recognize when they see this work, they can recognize themselves, they can recognize it in themselves, in their community, in the world. But now, mm. even though it was something could have been written 200 years ago, they're like, oh my goodness, that's like me. Yes. Or there's some stories like, oh yeah, but it and it and it touches their heart or it inspires or it educates. Hmm. That's what I feel is classic. Number hmm. two on my list of classic <laughs> is that usually 
the classic work is not a der derivative of someone else's work. Hmm. That's how you talk about Zora Neale Hurston and hmm. August Wilson. Hmm. Hmm. They can have been in see August Wilson was inspired by Romare Bearden. Mm -hmm. He was inspired by a collagist, a, a painter. They have inspirations, but his words, like a friend of mine, okay, I'll go off on different things. <laughs> so then, and the other thing that could make a classic. Yes, Diane McIntyre. Is it, it's been promoted. So people have to know about it. Hmm. And the first version of that promotion of it has to be so stellar in the way the person's language, if it's movement, the way the movement is. So that's why that's why it it has some an element that's so strong that it allows it to carry on over time. It it can have these other elements. People could recognize themselves or da 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 da, da and not being derivative could touch people's hearts or whatever. But if nobody knows about it, okay, so what? Hmm. You it might be a classic in a certain small circle. Mm -hmm. It could be a classic. Okay. And it must be extremely well crafted in the eyes of whom. Okay. Hmm. So anyway, I had a few examples. This is yeah. not really my story, but oh, is this interesting? Yeah. Okay. So I had a few quick examples. Like the Moors, the Moors Pavan by Jose Lamon. Okay. It was choreographed in 1949 and it's based on Othello. So you see that piece, it's like very like formal. And then the Iago comes out and da, 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 da. When you see that piece building, you know what's happening. You don't have to have seen any kind of dance before. And you like, and, and Iago saying, oh, your wife is da, 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 da. You know, he brings out this handkerchief. Oh, it's so well. You people can see it online. Oh, wow. it, it, it's actually, and they still do it today brilliantly. Mm -hmm. I saw them earlier. That, and you want to say, no, 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 don't believe him. <laughs> no, 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 don't listen. So you think of yourself. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, have I been swayed by people? Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. You see yourselves Amen. in yourself in classics. Mm -hmm or in Jitney and August Wilson's Jitney. I can't remember all the details, but I knew all those people mm. and what they were going through. Mm -hmm. Then I saw this play. I don't know, these plays just came to my August, Osage County. Yes. By Tracy Letts. Tracy Letts. I saw that piece, I'm like, oh my goodness, do we have some problems in our family? I mean, I'm like, <laughs> Yeah. You know, it makes you think about yourself. Hmm. And another piece called Death and the King's Horseman, which I yes. had the privilege of uh, choreographing with Mary. It was by Wally Soyanka. And it was um, Marion McClinton. Good friend of mine. It, I know he was. And he was the uh, director. And we had, so this was telling you about something, some people far away, but it's in colonial times. And you're mm. like, Oh my goodness, you see what can happen. You break down that culture, duh, duh, then everything goes haywire. And then when I heard afterwards that there were some people who were there from, who were um, nurses and doctors who came to see it. Hmm. And when they saw it, they came to understand more people who have medical issues where they refuse certain treatment because of their religion. Mm -hmm. They always tried to fight those people and say, no, you need this. You need this blood. You need this. Mm. After they saw that play, which is about Nigeria, right? Back in a long time ago, it shifted their minds. They had a new respect. That's what a classic can do. Mm. You mentioned yeah. August Wilson, and I want to make sure that we, uh, at least get to share a little bit of what it was like for you uh, collaborating with him uh, on, on King Headley and, <laughs> and uh, Joe Turner, right? right. Um, and then I want to make sure we get August in and we want to make sure we get into Saki Shange in before, okay. before we're done because okay. 
so much of what you have done is firmly connected to it seems especially your your experience with zaki but i love what you said in, in an interview about how uh and it actually inspired me to want to write a play <laughs> oh good you mentioned you are a very fine playwright you oh god bless <laughs> you you mentioned that um august wilson where there is music or dance in one of his plays it's always a turning point yes yes he doesn't just put that in for some uh little relief yeah no because in both pieces that i had the good privilege when i worked on um king headley the second august wilson was living then yes mary mcclinton was the um Oh, there's a little story. Marion was the director. There's a waltz in the middle of the play. And uh, Marion gave me a call and he said, we were doing this thinking the actors could just do this part on their own, do you know, as long as they could waltz, but it is not, doesn't seem to work. We need a professional choreographer. And then August said, get her. <laughs> and why he said, get her, because evidently he came to see Death and the King's Horseman. Uh huh. But, and which I didn't know, because, you know, I was just there for opening night. I, you know, so anyway, so I had the good fortune mm. to work on that section of the play in six different cities mm. as they developed it. And King Headley, there were about five different King Headleys. The, mostly the whole cast, the major cast, this is an aside, it's not so much, but it was interesting. Mostly the cast changed except for Charles E. Brown. Howard University grad. Yes. I have to throw it in there. <laughs> and, Charlie Brown. Uh, and, and also from Caribou, including. <laughs> right. Okay, okay. <laughs> Charlie Brown. Yes, one of my favorite people. Mm. So he, uh, so it was refined. And we we're at one place, we were, we, and you, and uh, of course, August Wilson is the writer. As a choreographer, I'm connected directly with the director right. who gives me his ideas and his direction. But there was one day when uh, Marion was ill and maybe the stage manager was conducting part of the rehearsal. And August Wilson and I would chit chat about just things, hmm. not about the play, just about current events or, you know, da 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 da. But then he said, he told me what he thought should be happening in that walls. He said, you know, and the guy who's the son, he's not even doing anything. He said, you know, he's got to do, do something. And then I think he actually made a shift in the way that part was, was written. Hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. You mean he needs to, he said, yeah. I'm like, he, he, he was a person to me, even though I've heard him speak in lectures and, you know, interviews, mostly interviews like that, in talking with him and just being around him, because he, he was at every rehearsal at every city, <laughs> in every city. He was always, if he wasn't there, he was just a little late. He was there all the time. But he, to me, he, he, he talked the same language as the musicians I knew. Hmm. He sounded like them. Hmm. You don't have to say a whole sentence. You hmm. understand the rest of it. He wouldn't speak like that in an interview. Right. But that's how the musicians, there's an underneath, underneath something you're supposed to understand. Amen. Without, that, was his, that, was my, that was my experience with his one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. Way, of, way of communicating. So I feel very blessed that I got mm. to be in his presence until it went to Broadway. And Charlie Brown was a fabulous waltzer. I said, and he, oh, I have to just honor him too. Amen. He would go over and over. He's like, even though he's a fabulous waltzer, he's like, wait a minute, should we have gone a little more that way? Or Tell us exactly. I'm like, yes, more that way. And let's do it again. He's like, okay, that was good. Okay, should we do it again? Yes, let's do it again. He was like that also in his monologues. His, 
he never marked. He never marked. It was a tech rehearsal. Hmm. He never marked his monologue. He was always building, 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 building. Like he didn't mark his dance. He didn't mark his uh, in the middle. At the, so this waltz came, and then it was him, and then she's with her son, and then a few wor the words are <laughs> choreographed inside the wall so you have the choreograph da, 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 when they say this and he's leaning back and he says this all that is intricate and then what happens she is just like in this euphoric state hmm. when this man's name is said during the waltz <laughs> leslie uggams did it just magnificently she went into this reverie because this man's when this particular man's name was said hmm. Everything exploded after that. Wow. But it wouldn't have worked if it had been just like, oh, pretty little dance. <laughs> it had to build. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that person doing that role had to be like, she, in another world, she went back in time, only in her body. She went back in time where she was so free and so happy. And the person saw that in her body, in her dancing and everything that was then the climax of the play came after that hmm. explosion after that. Da, da, what do you mean? Say, what do you mean? Da, 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 da. That's what August Wilson did with dance and hmm. music. Can yeah. you talk a little bit? Thank you for that. That Okay. August Wilson, Mary McClinton. <laughs> Your my people. Goodness. They my goodness. Um yeah. now your relationship and your time spent with with Zaki with Intasaki Shange mm -hmm. um is is what more people know about you in terms of people that with whom you've collaborated it seems. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the genesis of that collaboration of how you all met and how you all seemed at times intrinsically connected in, in terms of your work. Zaki came there to take classes with me. Hmm. So she was a student in my dance classes. She was always there. The class was usually packed with people and she was always in the front row with her friend, Paula Moss. Um, I didn't know personally about them. I knew about them as dancers. I knew them dancing. She always gave her everything in the class. She would just leap as high as she could and even higher than most people in the class. She was like a gazelle. Mm. She was she get she would just like ah oh, ah. Oh. She was a dancer to her heart. One day somebody showed me this uh script. They're like this uh this is written by, she wasn't right at there at the time. They said, this is written by Zaki. I said, okay, I'll read it. I read it. I'm like, what? <laughs> I said, little Zaki from class. <laughs> she wrote this. I said, she's a dancer. That's how we started out. Wow. Okay. That's how we started out. And some of the people from my class were in the original for colored girls. That's how they met. That's how she met them. So after class, they would go and uh, do something at a club and uh, do with the movement and the words and all like that. Mm. So then uh, her friend, Paula Moss was a dancer. They were both out in um, the Bay area. They both came to New York together. And they developed some of the for colored girls stories and they performed some of versions of them out there. So they came over here and Paula was the choreographer of the for colored girls that was at the public theater. However, the first version in New York was at Woody King's new federal theater. He inaugurated for colored girls into mm -hmm. the world into the New York world. Then it went from there to Joe Papp's public theater and then on to Broadway, all over the country and all over the world. 
And then um, Oz Scott, who is the director, just maybe two years after the tours, he wanted me to collaborate with him as on spell number seven, which was also at the public theater. Mm. So then I got to see the process. And um, so that was, it, it goes like this. It's like the poetry, the poems, mm. and then the a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people. Whoa. I can't name all those people in there. Mary Alice and wow. Mary Marshall and Avery Brooks and Laurie Carlos. Laurie Carlos, yes. First show and, I did in Minnesota. Yes, she in directed. Minnesota. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. All the people. Ellis. Hmm. And um Latanya Richardson. Yes took Zaki's place. Zaki would start in her plays and then she'd start them and then she'd then she'd go out and start working on something else. Something else. <laughs> something else. I have seen some a recent version, a recent production this year virtually of spell number seven. It knocked me out, Gavin, because wow. I'm like, whoa, everything she's saying, it's today. Wow. It's today. I'm like, whoa, hmm. that I, I, I had a few notes for the company. <laughs> they asked me. I didn't know that it was live. I could have called it earlier. It, it was on a screen. I didn't know they were doing, you know, but the, in this, the, um, the, it was done out in the, in the Bay area. Mm -hmm. The people did a brilliant job. I'm like, wow, Zaki, of course she had already passed away. So we did a lot of things together. We did yeah. other things that were in theaters, boogie woogie landscapes and this and that. We did some little things. They weren't little for, in our minds, they would be outdoors. They would be in a living room, in a loft. She, she didn't have to have a, her, her words also magical than speaking like no one else, hmm. bringing poetry into the theater, merging, making a, the choreo poem, merging movement, dance, and poetry. They, they're unified. They had to come together as one. So there's several of us who have been choreographers with her directly in her works. I was spoiled by working with her language wise and and uh spoiled and always looking for if it's not in Tazaki's language it's gonna have to be really uh skyrocketing out of here it must be really fabulous we inspired each other a lot can you, in our can dance. you talk and, about and, her language this what specifically about in Tazaki's Shange's language you feel spoiled you and, and, and set a standard that you had a hard time um, lowering when you had to, to work <laughs> with other people. What What is okay. it about her language? Because you, you talk about sh her language landed like no others. I find that your yeah. choreography lands like no, like what you did was innovative and talk about sounds in motion. I don't know if anybody yeah. was really doing that before you, bringing live yeah. musicians on stage, that being an integral part of what you created. What is it about her language that uh, that hits you like that? Okay, her language, it hits me in, I get, say, three ways. One, the language is musical. Mm. She's all into the music, the same music I'm talking about. Yeah. We knew all the same musicians. And the musicians played with her. The greatest musicians. You call in the new music, the new jazz, da 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 so her her words make me want to move just by the musicality of them okay then there is there is of course what she is saying mm. she has a way of sharing a certain history or a sentiment and emotion in a way that is so uh Unique is like an understatement. Mm. It, 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 it's like, where did that come from? 
Mm. Where, how, where, where, where does she get that? That uniqueness. That okay. So this first, the 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 color of the her words are like music to me. So it's like yes, I can flow with this because it's musical. And then the other is what it is she sang, and also the way she talks about. Mm, I guess black people in all shades, situations mm. Mm. and mm. it was also inspiring because she was so uh, knowledgeable mm. about everything sometimes we're working on a piece before the internet it's like who is that person she's talking about oh, <laughs> then you're like i think i'm supposed to know that who that person so <laughs> nobody in the room is saying excuse me who is, who that? is that nobody <laughs> was doing that then you'd have to go to a library wow. and look it up <laughs> you know she's all into the politics and the people and and she knew some of the people that was her that was the other thing hmm. and sometimes you couldn't tell if the person she's talking about is somebody she grew up next door to wow or if it's, or if it's a person who's a president of a country wow so, <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> yes she was one of a kind and also i like to say, say she was one of my very best friends mm. in life mm. yeah one of my very closest friends, yeah. And it's after after for colored girls was like a su super like, you know, super hit classic. Was this you know? Then she's come right back to dance class. Mm. Wow. Right back to class, and everybody's nobody's like, ooh, into Zaki. It's like, hey, how have you been? Did I? So you've contributed to so many major works in theater, film, television. <laughs> um, yeah, I, like I, I don't it. know if a lot of people know that you choreographed the film Beloved. Yes. Toni Morrison's Beloved that Jonathan Demme directed. Jonathan Demme. <laughs> yes. I was and saying. you got to work with the legendary uh, B. Richards. <laughs> Wow. That is an experience I will never forget. Mm. Yes. So we had, um, I'll try to tell it not to, and not be too long, <laughs> but uh, okay. I got to uh, Beloved because Jonathan Demme, now there is a genius and his genius uh, is, is, is genius in many different levels and ways. Okay. Mm. It's like the people he brings together. So he had invited Sweet Honey and the Rock to be in it because of the music that was going to happen. But he didn't want to just put the music on top. He wanted them in the piece. So uh, Ber uh, Bernice Regan, she said, well, if you're going to have movement in the piece, which there is a big section that is all dance, she said, you need to call Diane McIntyre. So that's how I got, that's how I was called by him. So the thing is that I was not so, I had done one film before called Miss Evers Boys, which was also a very ecstatic experience. But uh, I still uh, was not, it was not really my world. So I had to ask a friend who was Jonathan Demme, a friend who's in film. And she said, he did Silence of the Lamb. <laughs> I'm like, really? So I watched that movie. <clears throat> I like, oh my goodness, this is too scary. <laughs> Who is this man? Oh, <laughs> I had my image of him. And then also he did Philadelphia. Right, so, but right. uh, I, okay, so anyway, so I'm in sitting in the place in the room. I'm going to meet him, and this is going to be deciding if it's going to be me. I'm sitting in this room. Each person that walked in, I'm like, is that him? I'm like, that looks like that could be the director. <laughs> Silence of the lab. And then finally this man came in and he's like, Sunshine. He walks in a room. It was like sunshine. Mm. Just so hi, how are you? 
I'm Jonathan Demi. Just smile, and he was just a delight. When I read Toni Morrison's words, <laughs> there's another one. When I read her words, I see it. You know, I can see it. So, beloved is based not it. It, it is Toni Morrison's novel, beloved. We had auditions, and the auditions, I found that it was going to be not easy to choreograph everyone in a rehearsal because it's limited the amount of money that people are being paid so i actually rehearsed in the auditions mm. i set what i wanted in the auditions and had the people do it over and over again i told them I read them all the words that were going to be said by Bea Richards. I told them she was a queen. Mm. She was a person who is one of the most amazing theater matriarchs ever in the world. I did not say black. Don't put us in a box. That's another thing, Gavin. Don't say, oh, this is the greatest black so-and-so. I'm putting her, she, all these people I'm talking about, they are at the level of anybody of any color. So they had in their hearts, in their minds, Bea Richards, oh my goodness, we're going to be on the set with her. What I'll never forget is she came down, we were in Philadelphia, out in a clearing. They had built a rock for her and to stand on to give her preaching mm -hmm. and then when she came in walked down and they had a chair for her to sit before we start filming as soon as she was sat down and she was seated first the men and then everybody whew, mm -hmm. they just ooh, kind of tripped and ran, I mean, they ran, but was not aggressive, and they just bowed at her feet. Mm. Mm. And the women and the children, they were all bowed at her feet. Mm. They like, she's like, oh. So then we 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 began the filming. Mm. And um, and after she finished, then they uh, couldn't. The people were just after she finished her last words, she just said "Hallelujah," and uh, she uh, went sat down on the rock, and the people just gathered around her, mm. and there were tears rolling down their eyes. Mm. Mm. It was real. Yes. It wasn't a story. Because she's telling them, you must love yourself. Mm. You must love your hands. Because him yonder, meaning the slave man, he only wants your hands to do this or that. Da, 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 da. Right. Love your this. Because them yonder only wants you to da, 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 da. Love your back. In Toni Morrison's all her words, mm. and she sang it, mm. but it's not a play. It's not a movie. It's real. Mm. Everybody is there, mm. and their ancestors become them. It was deep. Mm. So at the end, I was up on a hill, because we couldn't be in the shot, of course. We were up on a hill and we could see all the people gathering and she was t saying some things, hallelujah, and, and, and just touching little children's heads, hugging mm. people and all like that. And Jonathan said, I can't cut. Mm. There's some place, there's tons of footage of after the part that actually you know, mm. was required for the film. Right. That was uh, all of us there would never forget it. It it was quite it was it was 
that was that was the real deal and Bea Richards mm, mm, mm. Hmm. she yes I say queen but there's something even higher hmm. <laughs> royalty that's what I said I said she is our royalty hmm. as a performer and as a human being so anyway that was beloved and oh. it's captured and Jonathan loved he loved the whole so he broke her her baby Suggs that was her name he broke it up into three sections he put it in the piece and he put part at the very end of the movie mm. speaking of royalty Diane I, mm -hmm. I have to say as we as we get near the end of this time together I I find you to be our royalty. Oh. No, I'm not even kidding. And and I think <laughs> those of us who have been lucky enough to have been touched by your work, to experience your work, or your life, mm. are much richer, are much, much richer in our lives because of what you bring, the, the courage, the beauty, the history, mm. and the honesty. Uh, that you bring as, a, as an artist is just, I mean, I haven't written in a while and sitting here talking to you, I am so insp inspired to get back to to that uh, yeah. and to telling telling our stories that are actually not just ours, but humanity stories, right? We, we're they are people, humanity people. stories, yes. Um, I just want to thank you. I just wanted to know if there's any anything else that you would like to share as we come to a close here about you your work uh your hopes for where we are where we can go um, anything else that you would like to share as we as we come to a close thank you so much but i just i want you to have the last word so please anything oh i, I said a lot but nothing that just like philosophical <laughs> is telling stories but as I see things um, mostly I'm very happy that during this time as this is being recorded it's in 2021 mm -hmm. okay July 2021 and it's a time when in the past year a lot of openness has come in the people's hearts in terms of bringing in to the arts and exposing the general public to the arts of people of color hmm. and and the indigenous people hmm. this is really a rich time hmm. because in the arts we get to learn all about ourselves not just ourselves in our community or our ethnicity we, we, we get to learn all about ourselves in the world and so I, I i encourage the artists just dive in and don't put yourself in a box don't let yourself be in a box like you come from your experience and also for the institutions be daring be mm. daring people be I, I did a piece all about my father it wasn't just about him it was his actual words mm. called I could stop on a dime and get 10 cent change when we were doing the piece and afterwards the people knew I was the director, choreographer, writer, along with my father, they would come up and they would be a person, usually a Caucasian person. They'd say, my father did those same games. He did, or the person depending, we did the same thing, but they're saying it like, isn't that curious? because you brought me into a world and that world is not different from mine. But we feel the same thing. Hmm. That's what the openness 
and now in the theater communities are doing. They bring all different backgrounds into the theater and those pieces can be classics because they're going to touch the hearts and the minds of people now and into future generations. Hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It's so true. I also want to say, I know I said end with your words, but I also want to bring up, you talk about your dad, your father. You also wrote a piece inspired by your mother. Right. Who was one of the first female, Afri African-American female pilots. Or right. Take off from yeah. a forced landing. Yes, that's right. My mother that was an, oh, she was a pioneer aviator. Yes. Hmm. And, uh, you know, we always knew our whole lives our mother was a flyer. It wasn't like we talked about it. Some people we've known our whole lives and they say, your mother was a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was daring. Hmm. Hmm. And I got inspired by her. I'm like, if she was daring flying, I have to be daring flying in my choreography. Amen. Yeah. So Amen. I did a whole piece. Yeah. yeah, about my mother, and she loved it. And when we came to New York, it was in it was done in New York. And when my mother and father came, <clears throat> he my father loved that she was a flyer too. She didn't fly too much after we were born. We went up with her when we were children. Wow. Uh, 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 but because of the nature of aviation, and she had children, and the danger of it. Uh, she she decided not to pursue it, con continue mm. with the pursuit of that. Mm. But when we got to New York, we invited the Tuskegee Airmen of the New York chapter. Yes. And, uh, they were just so delighted to be there. And they, my mother had trained with other men at West Virginia State College, which is now a university, who became Tuskegee Airmen. Wow. However, the people who were in this uh, New York group they did not know my mother personally, but they knew her well. Wow. They knew her reputation. Mm. And we were in a room and they were all talking about my mother and talking to her. They said, yeah, your mother could fly rings around the men. <laughs> That's how good she was. Mm. That's how good she was. And then later I said, Ma, you were say, talking all those things to the guys. You know, We never heard you say those things. She said, well, it's, you don't know what we're talking about. You, you <laughs> this is an aviation talk, mm. aviation talk. Mm. She was in heaven and so were they. Yeah, so wow. she, was, she was, both of my parents were great inspirations to me. Clearly. Clearly, yes. I'm sure that they're very, very <laughs> yeah. proud of you. Yeah. That you've con contributed to to this world, Diane McIntyre. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking some time to, to just share your work and your world and your thoughts and your passion with us. I really appreciate oh. it. Well, it's been my joy. Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that we get to collaborate together at some point Okay. Soon. <laughs> something that you're going to write. Okay. Yes. Something that I'm going to write. All right, okay. Diane. Take care. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.